Good afternoon. Good afternoon, and welcome to this year's Henry Russell Awards program and lecture. This is a very special event in the university's calendar, the day we honor a colleague with the highest distinction this institution can bestow, the Russell Lectureship. The 2024 Henry Russell Lecture is Karen Merzatko, whom President Ono will introduce to you shortly. I'm Mike Solomon, the Dean of the Graduate School. I would like to begin by sharing with you the history about the namesake for the Russell Award. Henry Russell earned three degrees from the University of Michigan, a Bachelor of Arts degree in 1873, a Law degree in 1875, and then a Master of Arts degree in 1876. Russell was born in Detroit and remained in Michigan after graduation, where he was a successful lawyer and prosperous in business. He was involved with the Michigan Central Railroad, Michigan State Telephone Company, Union Trust Company, People's State Bank, and the Detroit Steel Products Company. So very entrepreneurial. In February 1920, while in New York City, Russell took ill and died at age 67 from pneumonia, just as he was preparing to travel to Europe to bring home his son, Lieutenant William M. Russell, who was killed in aerial combat in World War I. In his will, Henry Russell left the university a $10,000 bequest to create an endowment fund. His one stipulation was that the income from the endowment should be used for additional compensation to members of the instructing staff. In May of 1925, the regents so established the Henry Russell Lecture as a way to recognize a senior member of the faculty with an honorarium of $250 funded by Russell's endowment. In addition, $250 was dedicated, this was 1925, $250 was dedicated for an additional award to honor a faculty member below the rank of professor for conspicuous service to the university. Although the funds from Russell's bequest have long ago run out, the university continues to honor its most accomplished faculty with the award in his name. I'm honored to be involved in today's ceremony to recognize our outstanding faculty members. I would like to invite Provost Lori McCauley to present the Henry Russell Awards to four faculty members. What a pleasure for me to present the Henry Russell Awards. And I have to say, it, looking at these colleagues, just remarkable and inspirational work. So we're all in for a treat today. Let's start. Will Professor Oliver Hameson please join me at the lectern? Oliver L. Hameson, an internationally recognized human computer interaction scholar, advances social justice through scholarly efforts to make social technologies less biased and more inclusive for marginalized populations. His foundational research on transgender identities and experiences has launched a new area of study, trans technology studies. Professor Hameson earned his PhD at UC Irvine and was named a President's Postdoctoral Fellow here at the University of Michigan. He joined the School of Information faculty in 2019 and directs the Community Research on Identity and Technology Lab. His research illuminates the complexity and care practices required when developing technologies for those who are excluded or rejected from mainstream platforms, yet seek online connection mechanisms to overcome isolation and build supportive groups. He has published 45 peer-reviewed articles and received a National Science Foundation Career Award. His students praise his expertise and the respect and deep listening he affords them. He's affiliated with the U of M Center for Ethics, Society, and Computing and is a senior fellow at the Center for Applied Transgender Studies. MIT Press is publishing his forthcoming book, Trans Technologies, which is due out in 2025. Professor Hameson, in recognition for your discovery of a new area of study focused on transgender experiences with technology, 
your commitment to your students, and your work on behalf of groups marginalized by mainstream technology, the University of Michigan presents you with this Henry Russell Award. Now, will Professor Justin Heinze please join me on that platform? Justin E. Heinze melds the practice of public health with psychology and education administration to investigate and prevent youth violence. He studies harmful adolescent behavior, suicide and firearm use, mental health disorders, dropout rates, substance abuse, the effects of social media, all to make schools safer for students, staff, and school communities. Professor Heinze asks, how does abuse, duress, and violence affect adolescents and influence future risky behavior? His scholarly goal is to transform schools into settings for violence prevention and health promotion. As principal investigator of the National Center for School Safety, he leads a multi-million dollar federal effort to expand violence prevention activities in schools nationwide. Professor Heinze, you are addressing one of the greatest public health emergencies of our time, school violence. In recognition of your work on behalf of children and the safety of all Americans, the University of Michigan presents you with this Henry Russell Award. Okay, will Professor Allison Davis Roboski please join me on the platform. Allison Davis Roboski, evolutionary ecologist and zoology museum curator asks, how do the traits of living creatures respond to changes in their environment and why? She answers in two ways, through scientific discovery and by, and by educating the general public, encouraging everyone to be champions for biodiversity in the face of future global change. Professor Davis Roboski earned her BA in biology and her PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology before joining the faculty here at the university in 2016. A scholar of amphibians and reptiles, she leads the largest university-affiliated herpetologic collection in the world, second only to the Smithsonian Institution. She has published more than 50 peer-reviewed articles in top journals and has received a $1 million career award from the National Science Foundation. At U of M, she's mentored 14 graduate students, three postdoctoral scholars, and 20 undergraduates in scientific research and community outreach. For these efforts, the U.S. Herpetologic Societies commended her with the 2021 National Meritorious Teaching Award. In March 2023, she led 35 undergraduate ambassadors in creating a new snake and salamander scientist spotlight, a hands-on museum exhibition that drew more than 1,000 attendees to campus to learn about biodiversity. Professor Davis Roboski, in recognition of your leadership in the scientific community of ecologists and evolutionary biologists, and in the engagement of the public for the safekeeping of our planet, the University of Michigan presents you with this Henry Russell Award. Will Professor Elliot Rouse please join me on the platform? 
As director of the University of Michigan's Neurobionics Lab, Elliot J. Rouse merges the fields of robotics, biomechanics, and neuroscience to develop, build, test, and validate new prosthetic and exoskeleton technologies, improving the quality of life for people with disabilities. As an undergraduate, Professor Rouse worked with high-performance mechanical systems as a pit crew mechanic for an international auto racing team. It was there he identified his desire to achieve social impact through engineering. He led development of the first ankle foot prosthesis that varies its stiffness step to step and leads the open source robotic leg project, which offers free online plans, control code, and instructions to build robotic knee ankle prostheses. Professor Rouse, you've developed a new class of bio-inspired prosthetic technologies that are making it possible for countless individuals with disabilities to walk. In recognition of your life-changing contributions to biomedical engineering and robotics, the University of Michigan presents you with this Henry Russell Award. Wow, congratulations again to all of you, and may your future endeavors continue to inspire and uplift our community. And now, I will turn things over to our president, Santa J. Ono, who will present the 2024 Henry Russell Lecture. It's wonderful to be with you on this occasion. And I was excited to, to learn of our continued uh, position as a world center for herpetology and snakes. We're in the Ruthven building, and you probably know that that's what he specialized in. And I was excited about the acquisition of a huge number of snakes this year. I'm sure you had something to do with that. It's such a pleasure to be with you and such an honor to join with you in recognizing the outstanding contributions of each of these faculty members um, and that, that they have made to our understanding of the world. We'll turn now to the Henry Russell Lectureship Award, which recognizes the accomplishments of a senior faculty member. The recipient is asked to deliver a lecture to the university community. It's an honor today to present this award to Professor Karen Murasco, I invite her to come forward as I read the citation she is receiving. Karen Murasco has dedicated her scholarship and medical practice the treatment of pediatric brain tumors, diagnosis, and the treatment of congenital spine and brain conditions, and treatment of children with complex craniofacial anomalies. She is a trailblazing neurosurgeon, a singular leader in a male-dominated field. In 2005, Dr. Morosco became the nation's first woman to chair an academic neurosurgical department, which she led for 17 years at the University of Michigan. She is the first woman to be a director of the American Board of Neurological Surgeons and to serve as president of the Society of Neurologic Surgeons. In 2020, she was inducted into the National Academy of Medicine, and in 2023, she received a Karen M. Murasco, M.D., Advancing Women in Academic Medicine Impact Award, which was renamed in her honor. Dr. Morasco, you have cared for thousands of children and trained a generation of neurosurgical residents in recognition of your trailblazing leadership and surgical prowess. The University of Michigan is proud to present you with the Henry Russell Lectureship Award. 
Congratulations. Please join me in welcoming the 2024 Henry Russell Lecturer, Karen Morusco, who will speak on, in celebration of patients, parents, sorry, a pediatric neurosurgeon's personal journey in the study of pediatric brain tumors and congenital anomalies. Well, I'd like to say first and foremost, thank you, President Ono. Thank you to the larger University of Michigan community. Um, I'm very honored to receive this lecture. And uh, I, I guess one of the things I realize is that as a pediatric neurosurgeon, um, I represent not only my patients, but I also represent uh, their parents. Uh, taking care of a child, one learns very early on that it's not just the patient that you're taking care of, you're taking care of the entire family. <clears throat> As a pediatric neurosurgeon, I recognize that I don't practice in isolation. Uh, pediatric neurosurgery is absolutely a team sport. Parents are an important portion of the treatment team, and I think many times they're overlooked. Uh, we always honor our patients, but I don't think we always honor the parents that keep everybody together and keep the team moving forward. Uh, many of us will say that parents ask the most challenging of questions, and as a, a neurosurgeon who practices in both the adult and pediatric world, I can assure you that getting a consent form from an adult for their operation is much easier than getting a consent form from a parent you're about to operate on their child. They will discuss with you whether or not you need to shave two hairs on their head as opposed to not really worrying too much about themselves when you're talking about an operation. And many times they not only ask us great questions, but sometimes they also show us the answer. And most importantly, they always challenge us to do better. Do better for their kids, do better for the future, and they often ask us how they can help become part of the future for other children. So I'm gonna talk about three areas, very diverse, and whom I've got a reasonable history of research, and for whom I think parents have been not only important, but guiding lights in many ways. I'll talk about hydrocephalus, I'm gonna talk about Chiari malformations and the formation of fluid pockets within the spinal cord called steerances, and I'm gonna talk about pediatric brain tumors. The question that many parents have asked, and this is something that goes on over many years, is why is a child's head getting so big? What is the problem? Why does my child's head look so funny? And I can tell you that I'm a child of the late 50s. I was born in the late 50s, raised in the 60s, and I reflect in my own lifetime an understanding of that. When I was first born, there was really not a good knowledge as to what was an open spinal defect versus what was a closed spinal defect. We didn't really understand that there could, was a spectrum of spinal dysrhythm that was out there. Uh, I was born with a closed form of spinal defect, which I had a tethered cord and a lipoma. But because they, we didn't really understand those differences, my mom will often say that the first time I was in the hospital, they were constantly measuring my head, constantly, constantly saying, wow, it's amazing, your head is growing along a normal curve. What's happening? And my mom said that she realized at that point there was just a lot of things that were not understood. And perhaps that's been one of the inspirations for me as to why I wanted to go into neurosurgery, and why importantly, I wanted to be a pediatric neurosurgeon. So you look here at spina bifida. This is an open spinal defect in which the spinal cord is not completely covered either with skin or muscle. CSF, the cerebral spinal fluid, is often leaking. And in these children, once the spinal cord is repaired, they'll often go on to develop hydrocephalus. And that often means that their head size is getting bigger and bigger. As opposed to this, which is the more common form of spinal dysraphism, in which you see a tethered cord. You see fat infiltrating into the spinal column. You can appreciate here 
uh, on an MRI scan, the fat, the fat infiltrating through an area of opening of fascia, but it's closed over with skin. This child is never going to develop hydrocephalus. What's hydrocephalus? I know that I'm speaking not just to my colleagues in neurosurgery today, but to the greater Michigan community, so I wanted to explain it to you a little bit. We make fluid within our brain. It's got an extraordinarily important uh, cushioning ability. It also acts as a communication uh, between various aspects of the brain. And that CSF is made by the choroid plexus. Hydrocephalus defines an area in which the fluid that is made within the brain is not capable of circulating and builds up within the brain. So normally you make it, you absorb it, and it's taken care of. In children with hydrocephalus, they make the CSF, but they don't have a way for it to either get absorbed or to circulate around. And that's what results in hydrocephalus. Not every child that develops hydrocephalus will die from it. Uh, this is a child from Guatemala that did not get a shunt, but in fact developed hydrocephalus and compensated for it. But the majority of children over time, if the hydrocephalus is bad enough, well, their heads will keep growing in size. This again, a child from our medical mission that we do down in Guatemala, uh, in which the child's head just kept getting bigger and bigger. Well, you know, as we looked over time, we know that hydrocephalus has been something that people have known about for centuries. Uh, the first written word about it was in the Smith Papyrus, going back to 3000 BC. Archaeologic studies have shown that there are various um, skeletal remains in which hydrocephalus is evident because of the way the calvarium is formed and the size of it. And there's even evidence that there were attempts at surgical correction of the hydrocephalus. Probably the oldest surgical papyrus reflecting this is the Edwin Smith papyrus from 1862, in which an attempt was made to, again, drain the fluid out of the head. But treatment options have been really impossible up until this last century. If we look back in the early 20s, we tried to readdress the issue again. Walter Dandy, one of the founding fathers of American neurosurgery, actually developed a canine model. And he tried to use a variety of techniques to one, either drain the fluid out of the brain, or two, actually stop making the fluid by cauterizing the choroid plexus. Uh, he worked extensively with his urology colleagues at Hopkins, looking at a way to, in fact, cauterize the choroid plexus, similar to what was being done within the kidney or within the bladder. Matson, the founder of pediatric neurosurgery in the United States, said that, you know, we tried again and again to create uh, a system by which we could shunt fluid out of one compartment, i.e. the brain, into another compartment. Uh, he created a lumbo ureteral shunt, and he used it in an eight-year-old. Unfortunately, that child eventually died of sepsis. And the problem was that sterilizing the tubes and making the tube such that it would be able to be placed in one area or another without causing harm was really quite difficult. In fact, he said um, that you really needed optimism if you're going to be able to try to get to the point that you could help these children. And along comes time and the right person. Born in 1916, John Halter was a proclaimed gadgeteer. I believe he fits very adequately the term that Louis Pasteur had, that chance favors the prepared mind. This was a mind that was prepared to think about the problem in a different way. He worked initially for a vacuum and oil company in their machine shop, creating instruments. He then eventually got a job as a technician in a hydraulics research laboratory. He and his wife had a child, Casey. Casey was born in 1956. He had a, lumbo, um, a lumbar, excuse me, myeloma meningocele, and as a result of that, developed hydrocephalus. Um, he was repaired from his myeloma meningocele about one month after birth at Children's Hospital in Philadelphia. And like most children with uh, myeloma meningocele, he went on to develop hydrocephalus. The way they dealt with it at the time was to keep tapping the ventricular system using a needle that would go through the anterior fontanelle, draining off fluid, withdrawing the needle. They would do that again and again, but it never fixed the problem. Kids kept developing further enlargement of their head, further enlargement of their fluid spaces. Uh, they tried various catheters in a, in a variety of children, but had problems. In fact, uh, the first child that 
had a uh, ball valve catheter system put, put in place, developed a cardiac arrest. Uh, and that child had the cardiac arrest because the catheter itself was so stiff. Um, looking at this, Halter, who was a bit of a tinker and an engineer, said there must be some better system. He was taking care of his child in the hospital at, uh, in Philadelphia when he noted that a nurse had been able to, in fact, clear out an IV by irrigating through it. And the thing that struck him was that a needle had been placed in the IV, the needle was withdrawn, and the IV tubing stayed intact. Thus became a passion of his. What could he do to find a way to develop a system to be able to better take care of his son and other children with hydrocephalus? He thought about the valve systems and recognized that a simple slit valve would allow flow in one direction, and if a second valve was placed on the other side, it would stop any reflux back into it. He also thought that perhaps a biocompatible synthetic substance could be available. What did he do? He went through the old-fashioned system. Rather than Googling, he went through all of the phone books, and he began to explore any of the plastic companies and rubber companies that were out there to see if there were any options that were available. In 1955, going through a patents office, looking at some of the requirements that were there from Dow, he found a plastic that might in fact be something that could be used. So here in Midland, Michigan, Dow had created a silicon derivative called Silastic. There were important characteristics about this. One, it could be um, it could tolerate extreme temperatures, so you could sterilize it. All of a sudden, there might be something that didn't have the risks of infection. It was biocompatible. Unlike all of the red rubbers that were being used at the time, it didn't cause inflammation. And it was flexible. It wasn't going to perforate the heart. It wasn't going to cause other kinds of problems. So the combination of the slit valve, a biocompatible substance, a neurosurgeon was willing to try something new, and a desperate father, the Spitzholter valve was created. Um, it had the slit valve system on either side, as I described. It was successfully installed initially, not in his son, and that was because his son at the time was septic and was quite ill. But the first shunt that was put in was in March of 1956, and it was a ventriculoatrial shunt because it was felt that it would be better to have the CSF return to the normal circulatory system. Casey, his son, eventually had a shunt put in in April. And again, poor Casey, he had had one of the earlier shunts. He had had actually a cardiac arrest after that, and as a result, had significant brain injury. So Casey suffered a great deal in the attempts of trying to get a working shunt. In 1956, Holter applied for a patent, and he eventually received it in 1961. Initially, the majority of patients that were getting shunts had to go to Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, uh, and the physicians would have to come with them. The combination allowed for the patients to have the shunt put in and other neurosurgeons to learn about it. In fact, one of the neurosurgeons that did that was from the University of Michigan. And the first publication of 80 patients, or sorry, of 50 patients who had received the initial shunt system was here out of the University of Michigan. 86% success rate for the valve itself. The largest problems centered around uh, infection. There were not problems with the valve. And so at that point, everybody felt that there was clear evidence that these valve systems were something that were going to be able to be used successfully in the treatment of hydrocephalus. But Halter was making these valves by hand all night long. He could only create very few of them every week. So his demand had increased so much for the children that were around the United States that needed shunt systems that he eventually formed the Holter Corporation. That corporation went on to create CSF shunts, heart valves, artificial hearts, pumps for kidney dialysis. Again, chance favored the prepared mind. It eventually became a corporation which was bought up by extracorporeal and finally Johnson & Johnson. And today, Johnson & Johnson remains one of the uh, key manufacturers of uh, shunt and shunt systems. So although Casey eventually died 
from the complications of sepsis. I can tell you that his influence and the number of children that have been saved, the number of adults that have been saved because of the love of a father cannot be underestimated. So we deal with hydrocephalus. This is a, a clear example of how wonderful a son can be. Here's a child who would have died in years past, who now has a normal functioning life because of a working system. And also, I think that we realize that as much as we understood shunts, we've only begun to understand even more the technology that's available to us. Using an endoscope, we now can create passages in portions of the brain that were not previously um, reachable. Neurosurgery is an area in which technology blends uh, with um, lack of knowledge to create new areas, and that becomes extremely important. I've always told residents uh, that I'm training that if you don't like change, if you don't like evolution, if you don't like technology, probably neurosurgery is not the perfect place for you. These new techniques are something that I don't think Casey uh, and his father could ever have imagined. But I think that we've been propelled, again, by the love of a father to look for better ways of taking care of common problems. Now, another area that I've been quite interested in has been Chiari malformations. I'll talk a little bit about this. This is a 16-year-old classic one that would have been presented to me. One of, my neuro, uh, one of my colleagues in orthopedic surgery would have said, you know, I've got this 16-year-old uh, girl. She's got headaches. She's got some back pain. She's got some scoliosis. But when I got an MRI scan to look over her uh, scoliosis, what I saw was her cerebellum came down through the opening at the base of the skull. And she's got this large fluid pocket, this black area within the spinal cord. So she's got a thing that we'd call a Chiari malformation with a syrinx cavity. Well, if you look at it anatomically, this area of the cerebellum normally will sit in this area above the skull base. In patients that have Chiari malformation, it actually extends down, causing a compression of the fluid spaces at the base of the skull. I explained to the mom that, you know, there's a variety of ways of taking care of the syrinx cavity. Um, years ago, people would talk about just draining the syrinx itself. But we found over the years that doing a decompression at the level of the frame and magnum was something that really would be beneficial. And then the mother asked me a question which I couldn't give her an answer to and then kind of pushed me to think in different directions. Why do you need to operate on the brain? if the problem is in the spine. And I don't think I had a very good answer for her. So we had just gotten a new ultrasound. Um, this is actually when I was a chief resident at, uh, at Columbia. And we took that ultrasound, and this is the area where we would be operating, the area of the cerebellar tonsils. There's the brainstem. And if you look at this, you can see this image will tell you. Nobody had really appreciated how dynamic the cerebellar tonsils could be in relationship to the spinal cord. You can see here, look at the pulsatility within that syrinx cavity. But once you decompress it, once you open it up and make things bigger, now look at it. The pulsatility within the cavity has changed. The cerebellar tonsils are no longer acting as a piston. And so I, I say, I think that it's really a question that she asked me that made me start to think about, how does a syrinx, in fact, form? Um, and so, again, looking at the origin of where this fluid pocket would form within the spinal cord, we've been able to understand now that those cerebellar tonsils can actually act as a piston, taking fluid that normally surrounds the spinal cord and actually force it through the virchow robin spaces into the central portion of the spinal cord, creating a cavitation or a syrinx cavity. If we look back at our history of how the term even came about, Chiari malformation, what we realize is that it really wasn't a malformation that these individuals named the cerebellar ectopia for, but it was because these people had either brain tumors or hydrocephalus. So even the naming of it was probably not correct, but it's the one that's applied over these many years. Understanding more about it, We've also looked at now MRI scanning, which is clearly the gold standard by which we can assess whether or not a patient may, in fact, have a Chiari. But 
again, many times the first reports are the ones that everybody uh, uh, notices and pays attention to, when in fact over time we begin to understand more and more about it. So in 1984, it was written that a Chiari malformation was anybody who had cerebellar tonsils that extended past five millimeters below the frame and magnum. We've now appreciated that that's probably not the case. And in fact, we've got lots of opportunity to figure that out. If we look at MRI scanning, as MRI scanning increased, so did the diagnosis of Chiari malformations. It's to the point now that it's one of the most common diagnoses presenting to uh, uh, the pediatric neurosurgeon. So it becomes important. Where are the cerebellar tonsils? What are, when is it important to, to think about a Chiari malformation? And what we find out is that, in fact, like most things that are related to biologic phenomenon, there is a morphometric measurement, which is a bell-shaped curve. So we know that cerebellar tonsils can extend all the way down at uh, the points that one is a young teenager. And in fact, they change over age. So as you are sitting here, part of your brain cells are disappearing. And so I can tell you that for those that are young, their brain is growing up until about age 15 or so, and that beyond that, the brain keeps getting smaller. So the cerebellar tonsils go down until about age 12 to 15, and then they begin to rise after that. And by the time you're in your 70s or 80s, there's going to be very well up above the uh, frame and magnum. And so it's really in that age group between 10 and about 20 to 25 that you see most of the symptomatic patients in Chiari. And it correlates very well with the, the cerebellar uh, ectopia, where the cerebellar tonsils are located. So there are risk factors, and we know that the further cerebellar tonsils extend through the frame and magnum, the more likely you are to have symptoms. So is the, is the positioning really important? Well, it is if you take it in correlation with symptoms. It is if you take it in correlation with what one sees on the MRI scan. And one of the most common symptoms are headaches. And I can tell you right now, though, that headaches are also an extraordinarily common finding, not specific only to Chiari's. And in fact, in young children, as many as 10% of migraines present in children that are younger than the age of 15. If you look at all of the symptoms and all of the things that have been associated with Chiari's, however, it literally fills up an entire textbook of medicine. It's everything from back pain to neck pain, from numbness to tingling, to difficulty swallowing, to snoring. If you name it, it has had probably an article written about it as being associated with Chiari. So we need to get a lot more specific. What about fluid pockets? Um, well, the syrinx cavity within the spinal cord, it can be anything from an enormous one like the one you see here in the cervical area to a smaller one as we see here in the thoracic area, just something that's just a dilated central canal. It really shouldn't be called a syrinx. I'm a surgeon. I've got to think about what it means to operate on patients. Do I choose them just because of a, a finding? Well, no. I think that one needs to understand the, uh, the physiology of the lesion, and I have to ask that mom. That mom's question was a good one. What is it that really means you need to operate on the patient, and why is the operation that you're going to do the best one for that patient? So we think about the anatomic findings of a Chiari malformation. We think about the symptoms. It's not just headache. It's headaches that are specific. They're related to the Chiari. Those that are associated with coughing, sneezing, so-called tussive headaches. We also want to see something on the uh, MRI scan. It's not just the ectopia itself. It's also whether there's a, a syrinx cavity within the spinal cord. And then finally, scoliosis. You know scoliosis can be associated with that syrinx cavity, but mild scoliosis that really has no evidence of a syrinx is unlikely to be associated with any problem of the frame and magnum. So we've begun to understand that you know, there's a lot of literature out there on Chiari's, but that a careful analysis of it is something which has been important to at least some of the folks that I've been working with. So there's really no consistent consensus about the level of cerebellar ectopia. Symptoms from Chiari malformation are rare, but asymptomatic Chiari's are actually pretty common, and we're seeing more and more of them. We know that the symptoms associated with uh, uh, syrinxes are more likely to become important the, the further down the cerebellar tonsil glows. And we also know the patients with severe symptoms 
will in fact benefit from surgery. It's kind of nice to know there's actually something which if you carefully assess it preoperatively, you'll actually be doing the right thing and the patients will get better postoperatively. And then we also know that unlike many things where there's progression, many times in patients where this is incidentally found, they're not gonna go on to have any problems and we can feel actually relatively confident that this is a finding on a radiograph, not something which requires surgical um, intervention. Parents ask difficult questions, but they are meaningful, and they can be important to our overall um, assessment and plans for our own careers and research. Probably the most difficult question I get asked is, will my child live? And I get asked that question regularly from parents, particularly of children who have brain tumors. If we look at brain tumor statistics in the United States, primary brain tumors in both adults and pediatric patients are pretty rare, about 25,000 of them in the United States in a given year. Only about 3,400 children under the age of 15 will be diagnosed with a brain tumor. It's the 10th leading cause of death in the US, but among children, it's the leading cause of cancer-associated death. And the symptoms, they can be varied depending upon which portion of the brain you're talking about and where the lesion is located. We know that overall, still the most common form of cancer in children is leukemia. But with better treatments, survivability has gotten better. And in fact, the leading cause of death from cancer, again, are brain tumors in children. The tumors that I've studied the most have been medulloblastomas and astrocytomas, and more recently, ependymomas. Here's an example of a typical patient. Michael is an 11-year-old. He was healthy. Um, he comes in now with a two-month history of intermittent headaches. The headaches are worse over the last week. They've increased in duration and frequency. He now has also several days of emesis. He was noted to by his parents to be a little bit off balance, not, work, not walking quite as well over the last six weeks or so. And if you look at his imaging, what you see here is a tumor, again, located in the posterior fossa. And I will point out, look at his cerebellar tonsils, going back to our last finding. They can be a little bit low here. This is an example of not as somebody who has a Chiari malformation. It's a child who has a brain tumor. This is a tumor that's located within the fourth ventricle and, in fact, turns out to be a medulloblastoma. And years ago, this is how we looked at these tumors. This is a histologic examination of it. H&E standing in which we saw small, round, blue cell tumor. In fact, people often describe them as that. But now you can see that even with histology, there was a variation on theme here. Here's the classic finding of a medulloblastoma, but then you had others in which there was a more nodular finding, and then we had some that had more features of anaplasia with necrosis, and perhaps more in the way of changes uh, within the uh, mitochondria and within the, the cells themselves. We know that medulloblastomas also had an important aspect of outcome, looking at staging, uh, whether there was evidence of spread of the tumor in other locations. So we had things that we could look at, but we didn't really understand why some patients did really well and some patients did not do as well. And so when a mother, as would be appropriate, would ask me, is my child going to survive this? I would have to say, well, the best data that we have suggests that this percentage of child would live, this percentage of child would not. What we began to realize is that the best possible surgery was to try to take out as much of the tumor as we could, but that all children were going to require radiation to prevent the spread of tumor throughout their central nervous system, which had real risks to the developing brain, and that chemotherapy had been an important adjuvant to the treatment of these children. When I started out in my residency, the survival rate for a child with an, an M1 uh, level of metastasis and a typical medulloblastoma was somewhere on the order of 35 to 40%. Today, that survivability is closer to 85%. So we've made a difference. What has been some of the important things that we've been able to do? One of the important things is that we've begun to analyze them in a way which is no longer based solely on histology. We've actually begun to look at molecular subgrouping I'm not going to go into all of the details here, but you can clearly see that the, these subgroups happen at different ages and they have different survivability. 
Here is a typical patient with a standard risk medulloblastoma. They're going to do very well with therapy. A child that has a group C medulloblastoma is not. And we've actually now begun to tailor our therapy to be more aggressive for those tumors where have lower survivability. But that does mean also accepting perhaps higher risks in those children for long-term outcome. The subgroups of medulloblastoma are different based on not only the age of the patients, but also on the genetic profiling. And it's understanding that genetic profiling that's been important for us over the years. Medulloblastoma long-term sequelae have been something that I've been interested in because I do recognize that no longer is just survivability the only gold standard. We're also looking to see that we have patients that survive and do well. And unfortunately, long-term outcomes from radiation therapy in the developing brain have suggested that it really does cause significant deficits. Um, also, there are surgical injuries that can occur. When we started our study, Dr. Robertson and I, we actually looked to see what was the outcome of patients who had had posterior fossa resections. It had been thought to be about 2 to 3%, maybe as high as 5%. When you looked at the data really clearly, what you saw was upwards of 25 or 30% of the children are actually hurt by the surgical approach. Well, we developed better surgical approaches to try to bring that number down. The clinical findings in children who develop cerebellum mutism can be pretty complicated. They are very, very labile emotionally. They have this high-pitched cry. The children will often be mute. They have a significant speech apraxia and ataxia, as well as difficulty with their eye movements. All of those are really unacceptable outcomes. And parents will say to you, you know, if you're going to take care of my child, you've got to think about them as more than just an entity in which you're going to operate on them, but more about what's going to happen long term. Neurocognitive uh, disability is something which we do now appreciate has really been uh, affected in the children who have received radiation early on. They have endocrine problems, they have sensory and neurologic deficits, and then long term they can develop secondary malignancies. Uh, their nervous system, their vasculature can, can uh, age more rapidly so that they develop more in the way of aneurysms and atherosclerotic disease. And there are then the social and psychological effects. The IQ loss is clearly related to age, and that's influenced our ability to treat children under the age of five with radiation. That's something we really avoid at this point. We're now choosing different chemotherapy protocols for that. Probably the best part of what I do is that I don't work in isolation. I work with a team of individuals, and treating these children, it, it's really important that that team be assembled. We're very lucky here at Michigan and that we've got a variety of providers, all of whom focus their attention on trying to give the best possible care to that patient and that family. But the questions never stop. The parents always want to know, what's going to be the survivability for this patient? What's the survivability for my child? We know that the high-grade gliomas have a very low chance of long-term survival, and now we're beginning to analyze these high-grade gliomas in a different way. You look here again, we looked at IDH mutation. We've looked at the, the various chromosomal and um, molecular changes that occur. And again, before we used to look at simply the histolo histology, looking here at the different types of brain tumors and looking at their H&E stains, we now think about them in a very different way. 2016 was a really big year. It was the year that the World Health Organization decided to change its classification of tumors. They now looked at things like whether or not there was a 1P or 19Q co-deletion. They looked at whether there was ATRX loss. They looked to see whether or not there was IDH mutation. All of these are appreciations that we had that the tumor types could really be looked at in a molecular way. This new classification also represented some important problems for us because the survivability of tumors was really based on whether you could take it out or not. We were now seeing that there were subgroups in which variations of chemotherapy on different types of radiation could be very beneficial. But again, we knew that the prognostic value of surgical resection was important. We saw that survivability was increased by the extent of resection and that the effects of radiation and chemo could help us with that. But the one thing we did also learn was that if you put somebody back, if you hurt them, 
all the gains that you might have been making with radiation and chemo were lost by virtue of the harm that you might cause at surgery. And so we began to look at a way to be more precise and to be able to look at tumors in a, in a different way. We knew that there were going to be things within tumors that were going to be important to be able to assess in the operating room. But there was no easy way to make that assessment quickly, reliably, and consistently to give us a better chance of resecting tumors. So there began a quest with our colleagues in the uh, engineering department, as well as in biochemistry, and with our a variety of researchers to look at ways in which we could look at the tumors that we were resecting and whether they represented tumor. So before that, we looked at to, to see whether it was normal versus abnormal. We didn't really have a good method. What we started to develop was a rapid sequencing methodology using Raman technology to actually look at tumor margins while we were resecting them. Initially, it took us usually an hour or two to be able to get to our re readings back. But most recently, we're getting it back now within minutes. And so it, it actually allows us to look not just at whether or not it's a tumor that we're taking out, but the type of tumor, the area of tumor that we're um, resecting, and actually able to do this in real time in the operating room. This stimulated Raman histology it went from being a concept to uh, eventually getting to the bench and finally to the bedside. And it's something that we've been pioneers in. I'm proud of the folks that have been working on this, and I'm glad that pediatric tumors were among the first ones that it was used on. Using AI, we were able as well to understand now all the various molecular genetics that could be applied to this system. And it was this paper that really began to make us understand that the use of Raman spectroscopy in the operating room was such that it could really improve our ability to resect tumors. No longer were we just talking about whether it's dark blue or whether it had necrosis or whether it had mutations. We were now actually looking at the molecular genetics of it to be able to understand the, the, that absolute point between normal and abnormal tissue as to what we could accomplish with resection. We now were using the enormous computing ability to be able to bring to bear all of the various genetic mutations that were part of uh, the brain tumor. Again, this, this precision in molecular histology is something that we're continuing to improve upon and will require lots of uh, input and information to be able to better assess outcome for our patients. But I'm getting better at answering the question when a mom says to me, is my child going to survive this? We're also understanding that it's, a, it's an international consortium that really allows us taking these very rare tumors to get the most information. And I'm happy that we're part of that larger and international consortium. So we know the tumor resection is important. We know that, that it's important as well that, to take out as much tumor but leave as much of the normal brain intact. We know that this is true whether it's being treated with chemotherapy or radiation therapy. The smaller amount, the better. We also know the eloquent brain is surrounding most of what we're dealing with. Unlike other areas of tumor that can be resected with margins, the idea of a margin and a brain tumor is really not possible because of the functioning tissue. So how do we take them out safely? Well, mapping is one of the ways we can do it. We can map out language. We can map out motor and vision. We can actually do this by in the operating room, working on the brain, with a patient that's actually awake and talking to us. I've done awake craniotomies in patients as young as nine years of age. And believe it or not, they can be helpful partners in the process of operating. So when you see an ugly tumor like this, we can actually take it out with great success. And finally, we even take out tumors in a way differently than when I first started. We take them out in sections so that we can actually use spatial transcriptonics to be able to assess various aspects of the tumor with respect to individual cells. We look at these small samples, we can actually see genetic changes within areas of the tumor to be able to be more aggressive in those areas which have, which have the worst genetic um, um, and makeup. And we can identify as, 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 as small cell populations within the larger 
heterogeneity of tumors. We're advancing treatments. This data has led us to develop in vivo laboratory models to test, to test the pathways and to identify the vulnerabilities of our various resistant cells. This is going to be important because these tumors are, in fact, devastating. We, just, we haven't met all of the needs of our patients, but we're trying to. Um, and I also point to MyOncoSeq, which is one of the ways in which we're trying to get better analysis of the brain tumors. Again, something unique to the Michigan family. We started back with the, with the registry of tumors, taking out every tumor, and we made sure that we kept specimens. We did that starting back in the early 90s. Turns out that this has been one of the areas that has helped us the most. By having this large number, large volume of patients that we've had banked tumors, even patients who have not uh, survived their tumors, they act as leaders and in, in, in spirit us on because their tumor specimens are still providing us and giving us important information. And I go back to what I said before. It's a multidisciplinary effort. We developed the first multidisciplinary brain tumor program in the pediatric side. But we did it again also on the adult side. And it's a collaboration of oncologists, neurosurgeons, radiologists, radiation oncologists, um, really treating the patients and their families as one. There's been significant progress. We've expanded the amount of clinical trials we're doing. We're working with national groups. We've got a multidisciplinary brain tumor clinic program. We also have a, a functional wellness because the long-term outcome of children with brain tumors is something that's really possible now. And so I come back to the initial theme of what I had for this talk. You've seen three separate areas here in which parents have been crucial to the overall outcome of their children. The love of a parent created a shunt. The question of a parent made us understand what was going on in Chiari's in a better way. And the challenge of parents to be better is something that keeps propelling us uh, with our treatment of kids with pediatric brain tumors. That challenge never ends. It hasn't ended for me, and I, don't, I know it hasn't ended for the wonderful researchers and colleagues that I work with at Mott. I'll say this again. Parents challenge us, but those challenges are important. They've guided me, at least, in a career which has been extraordinarily fulfilling and continues because there are so many answers still to be had. And I would suggest to you, for me, it's about my patients, but it's also about the parents and what they've asked me. Perhaps for you, it's about your students or your colleagues. Each question that's asked by careful, caring, dedicated individuals can act as a real resource for each of us to do more and better in our research. And so I say thank you. Thank you for this Russell Lectureship and for this honor. And I thank the parents. Imagine the first time I used an endoscope in the early 90s for the first time at Michigan on a child to be able to, uh, in, crack, in fact, create a third ventriculostomy. I'm thinking about the time that I actually said to that mom, well, there's only a few places in the country that are doing it, and we want Michigan to be one of those places, so I think I know enough about how to use the scope and the anatomy to be able to do it. And that mom had the ability, and that father, to sign off and say, yes, I want you to try to do something that's never been done before. That takes tremendous courage. I say thank you to those parents that entrusted their most precious item, their child, their, the person they cared about most in their life, into my hands. And I thank each of you for coming here today and listening to me talk about some of the things that are near and dear to my heart. So thank you, and I thank the larger university community for this honor. so much for your lecture. If you're willing uh, to take a couple questions, thank you.
Uh, we have microphones that we can pass. Uh, we also have the ability for questions from online. Uh, and those in the room, if you have a question, we'll begin here. Thank you. Dr. Marasco. Thank you. We're very thankful to have you. This is a happy day. Once again, the Smith family hmm. and the University of Michigan thanks you. Thank you so much. I have a question, um, and this is from someone that has a brain and a spine, but has learned a lot from your talk. Uh, I guess I always think of them as being static objects, and I was quite amazed in your clinical videos how much things were moving around. Could you talk a little bit about that, uh, the good and the bad of that, please? I, well, the good of it is that it's uh, a dynamic system, and there's flow between various parts of it, to be honest with you, when I started studying to try why did a syrinx develop in a patient with a Chiari, I don't think any of us really appreciated how dynamic it was. Uh, MRI scanning and ultrasonography have really shown us a great deal about it. The problem with that, it means that when you think of it and you look at pictures, you're looking at something that's stagnant. So all of a sudden our perception and our understanding of it has to change. And I think, we, we, I think because we look at things in, in imaging, what we don't really see is that everything around us is really a video. And so all of our physiology, all of the things that are happening, the streaming that happens within tissues, uh, the movement that occurs across areas, it, our, our mindset focuses on it as a stagnant process, but it's not. It's very dynamic. And particularly in pediatric neurosurgery, I've got to think about growth. When I think about something as simple as a shunt, I may have a, somebody who's going to be you know, an NBA star. So I need to make sure I've got enough tubing to be able to make, meet that. Um, I need to make sure that I can understand as well the idea of microtrauma. So one of the things that I've very, been very interested in is the scarring that can occur because of something like a lipoma existing in the lower portion of the spine or after someone has had a repair of something like a myelomeningocele. Believe it or not, the spinal cord is constantly pulsating. It's a little bit like Chinese water torture if that is stuck. It's someone sort of poking continuously at it. And so sometimes we have to create systems in which we can untether people like that to be able to improve their outcome. Um, the more I study, the more questions I have, but often what I have found is that the questions that are asked of me that are the hardest that I can't answer means that's the area that I should be focusing on for my next question and next research. We have time, another question in the back? Yes, please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for a very compelling uh, presentation. I, re I really enjoyed it. Uh, just thinking back to M Mr. Holder and how he looked through the, the phone book, uh, how would you assess the, whether the widespread availability of medical information on the internet, for example. Has that prompted uh, more sort of out-of-the-box questions from, from parents and from the public? Or, yeah. Well, I, first of all, I always tell them you never know who's writing what on the internet and that you want to look for reliable sources because Joe the plumber could be telling you that this is the way you should take out a brain tumor. Uh, and so you need to you know, make sure that you, you understand that. But I also find that the consumer that I'm talking to now, the parent, the patient is very much more educated. And so I find it actually easier to have an honest conversation of what I know and what I don't know. And so it's that balancing act of saying to them, this is the best information that I have. These are the possibilities, and this is what we are going to try to do. And they're much more understanding of it. Frankly, I think early on people 
honestly believed that things were like black and white. You know, yeah, I mean, it's, I, I always loved when a parent would say to me, um, I don't want you to have a complication today. And I thought, well, I agree with you, but I didn't come to work with a chit in my back pocket saying, oh, today I'm going to use up one of my complication chits. And so I, I, I kind of recognize that. And I think parents are more understanding now because they do understand from the complexity of the problem and the various things that can occur. But I also point out that the majority of times that they're reading in the internet are people who have had major complications. And so, you know, they're often extenuating circumstances associated with it. So I'm pretty careful to, to be as honest as I possibly can be, but to make sure that I've tried to provide a fair and balanced assessment of what the risk, benefit, and alternatives are for a given procedure. But it's hard. I, I, I like the fact, though, that people have more information. We have time for a final question. Great. Well, let's thank our Henry Russell lecturer once again, Dr. Mazzocco. <laughs> <laughs>